Hello, time travelers. Each of you remembers the legendary trilogy, Back to the Future. But who are we going to talk about today? Marty? Doc? Or the car? Almost got it, my dear friends. The creator of the legendary muscle car. Do you know who that is? That's John DeLorean. Yes, yes, that's him. The creator of the legendary DeLorean DMC-12. And instead of this ride, a refrigerator would shine on TV screens and every kid could feel like a traveler. But it's way too dangerous, and the director and the producer offered to take the real car, but not any car, but exactly the DeLorean DMC-12. Thanks to which, now we also learn about the life of a magnificent inventor. John DeLorean was born in 1925 in Detroit. Those were hard times, especially for the family of John DeLorean who, by the way, was the eldest son of his dysfunctional family. Why dysfunctional? Could a family that fights and quarrels be happy? No, of course not. This is what led to the divorce in 1942, and after that, Catherine Preback, John's mother, went to California while his father, Zacharias DeLorean, began to sink into depression and serene drowning in alcohol. Considering that the DeLorean family were immigrants from Romania, he didn't know English very well. Besides, he worked at Ford's factory, a video about which we have on our channel. And you know what? He wasn't very good at it. So he thought about it and decided he needed to study. And so, after public school, the boy entered a technical college, which he graduated with honors and received a scholarship to study at Lawrence Institute of Technology. The World War raged in Europe, and John DeLorean was drafted into the army where he spent the next three years. Finally, the end of the war. And miraculously, the soldier returned to Detroit, completed his education, and entered Chrysler Institute, easily earning a master's degree in automotive engineering. And there it was, the moment to start his professional career. John was motivated and ambitious which is why he didn't stay long in his first job as a production engineer at Chrysler. As he said, I'm made for more, and I'm supposed to promote the automobile industry, not act as a cog in the system. And even more so when you're young and not that trained, and Packard offers $14,000 a year, it was a very tempting opportunity. Packard wasn't going through the best of times back then. Ford, General Motors, and American Motors had embraced the concept, mass production of inexpensive cars for the general public. Firms like Packard tried to hold on to the tradition, focusing on luxury cars. John DeLorean was called upon to breathe new life into the inexorably aging Packard. The young inventor mastered his knowledge of marketing and management while working on an automatic transmission for the Packard. None of us doubted that John would complete his work with success. And so, when the project is done, the patent is granted. Another achievement, of which by the end of John's life, there were more than 200. Think about those numbers. 200. Too many for us, and just right for an outstanding designer. And so, in 1956, John left Packard, because it was time to move on up the ladder of success. The next step was the mega corporation of General Motors. General Motors' vice president, Oliver Kelly, made an offer that our engineer could not refuse. The essence of the offer was to choose any position in the company. And what position would you choose? I think the most promising one in the best department. But John thought otherwise. He was looking several steps ahead. His choice was the dying Pontiac department. And in no time at all, DeLorean's chief designer had taken the dying brand to the top of the market. The Pontiac GTO was something new on the market. It had won the hearts of millions. It was the first real muscle car. Imagine, you're a little over 30. You're sitting in a car with an eye-catching exterior, but at the same time, strict and elegant design. And how does it make you feel? That's right, like you're 18. So the car was the perfect model for young and mature people. The Pontiac department became the most profitable in General Motors. In 1970, John DeLorean was transferred to the Chevrolet department, and here, in three years, he raised sales to the level of competitors from Ford, as if he had a magic wand. Or maybe he was in cahoots with the fairies, 
How else to explain his ingenious marketing strategy unless a little talent and hard work? Of course, such merit demands the right reward, and John DeLorean is promoted to Vice President of General Motors. But this was the maximum an engineer could achieve in the company. If DeLorean observed the conservative style followed by the top management and refrained from the eccentric lifestyle, but even observing all of this, what to do with the character and behavior that made him a frequent guest of the press, namely sections of scandals and sensations. In the end, with the top job at General Motors, they had different paths. And naturally, our ambitious designer was not enough, holding a grudge against the board of directors. John left the company with a condition of refusal of constructing cars for profitable pension. But can you live with money without your favorite business? John could not. And after sitting in silence for only a few years, our hero decided to return to the automobile industry, obsessed with the idea of creating a stylish, high-tech sports car for an acceptable price for the target audience. Management of General Motors had deprived at once the pension of the inventor who has broken the agreement. In reply, John has written the book and called it, On a Clear Day, You Can See General Motors having told in it the most doubtful and unpleasant features of the company and personally its leaders. Of course, the management was furious at such a thing. It's just mean, you may say, but it's fair you can't forbid a person to do what they like. DeLorean introduced for the first time a new car at a private party, a so-called party for rich people, offering all present to be the shareholders of the company. The sample shown was gorgeous and very expensive looking. The design was made by none other than the famous Giorgetto Guigiaro. The highlight of the DMC-12 were the gullwing doors, which John was most proud of. The stainless steel body kept its original gray color. The car looked stunning, and it was clear that it had no equal on the market. A friend, Bill Collins, agreed to leave General Motors to work at DMC. They worked day and night. DeLorean loved his creativity as expressed in the car. From Collins's memoir, in the early stages of creating the DMC-12, it was like the second coming. People around were saying it would change everything. But there was one problem. You had to set up production. And there was no money. So the idea was born to build a factory in Northern Ireland. Why Northern Ireland? Well, at the time, the War of Independence was in full swing in that country, and it was a good chance for Britain to settle the conflict. John received from the British government $140 million for factory construction and creation of workplaces. But there was one detail. The people who were going to be hired at the factory never built cars in their life. Unfortunately, it was the beginning of the company's fall. And yes, this period can be called the beginning of the end. And so the businessman founded DMC, announced a tender to build a factory, and chose the British government as the business partner. The factory was built in Belfast in two years, after which the mass production of a single two-seat coupe, which was called the DeLorean DMC-12, began immediately. It was powered by a six-cylinder, three-liter PRV center-mounted engine. PRV is an abbreviation of Puget, Renault, and Volvo, who jointly created the engine. Both manual and automatic transmissions were available. The suspension of all wheels was independent. The main feature of the muscle car was a low, wedge-shaped body, made entirely of stainless steel. The body was polished to a high gloss and unpainted and the two doors tilted upward, for which it was called gull wings. It weighed about 2,900 pounds, had a top speed of 105 miles per hour, and could reach 60 miles per hour in 9.6 seconds. Its characteristics were impressive, and its appearance fascinated. Everyone drooled at the sight of this beauty. John DeLorean meets the famous Colin Chapman, designer and creator of Lotus Cars, an outstanding man with golden hands who will work for John as an engineer. The Americans who came to Northern Ireland, including Bill Collins, were surprised because it became clear to them that something was going wrong with the financial part of the deal. 
Everything was moving too fast. Imagine you just arrived in another city and want to relax, and you are immediately dragged on a tour here too. In many ways, because of the inexperience of the workers, the lack of proper control of DeLorean himself, and the cars had many technical problems with electronics, engines, wipers, even the doors, which often did not want to open vertically. In addition, the DMC-12 was not as fast as promised. It cost more than the Corvette, and of course the first buyers were disappointed. John DeLorean, instead of slowing down production and working on product quality as any entrepreneur would have done, decided to do just the opposite. He increased the rate of car production. Under an agreement with the British government, the amount of subsidies was linked to the number of jobs. DeLorean was forced to expand production for the sake of new investments, so John had no choice. And unfortunately, this quickly came to an end. The Conservatives came to power in Britain, and Margaret Thatcher decided to cut the budget infusion into Northern Ireland. Moreover, the British government demanded that DeLorean return some of the money. The DeLorean Motor Company was on the verge of bankruptcy, and a few million had to be found urgently, somewhere. This car was DeLorean's dream. He put all his talent, strength, and most importantly, soul into this project. On paper, the sports car looked fantastic. It was very usable, but the number of problems kept it from normalization. Among them were the gasoline crisis of the 1970s, the low quality of Irish workers, who had never been involved in such things as developing sports cars, because for them, it was the same as acting a doctor to fly a plane. So John DeLorean's dream was slowly being shattered. The company produced 8,500 cars in three years. It's frustrating to watch your dreams get crushed, which is why John DeLorean decided to take an extremely risky gamble. We don't advise you follow his example. A good drug is only the one you buy in the pharmacy. And now, the threat of bankruptcy looms. There is nothing but risk. But as is his way, as always, he goes for broke. Having accepted 25 kilograms of cocaine from drug dealers, that's 25 kilograms. Crazy money. How many Philadelphia rolls can be bought with that? But John would let them go into business to finance the project and keep the DMC running. In October 1982, he was charged with drug trafficking and faced a big prison sentence. But he got lucky and managed to prove his innocence. In time, his lawyers dug up enough information that the whole story was set up by the FBI and envious people from General Motors. You can imagine how vindictive people were in General Motors. They could not put up with John's talent. The first lawsuit was followed by others, accusations of fraud, tax evasion, and other crimes. Of course, thanks to the lawyers, DeLorean fought off the jealousies. But time and money inexorably flowed into the abyss of events. The car of the future had to be forgotten and left only as a dream. Fortunately, there are people who have not forgotten about the DeLorean DMC-12, made it a time machine in the famous Back to the Future movie. Everyone will agree that the DMC-12 is a great breakthrough in mechanical engineering and even more so for young dreamers. Even Doc said, if you build a time machine into a car, you have to choose the most stylish and futuristic one. Undoubtedly, the DeLorean car is a symbol of the 1980s. The film fixed the image of the muscle car of the future. John, in turn, got the glory back and was able to have a decent retirement. The brilliant designer, engineer, and dandy because, buried according to his will, in jeans and a black leather jacket, a true time traveler died of a stroke on March 19, 2005 in New Jersey. The movie spurred interest in the DeLorean DMC-12. The car had previously been considered a popular car, and after the release of Back to the Future, it became a real object of love. In fact, there is something really fascinating in this car. You look at it and see echoes of the future in the past. 
Who knows how the history of John DeLorean could have developed if not for the setup of the FBI and competitors from General Motors. Probably we would have seen not only one car from the future, but a series of cars, which would have stuck in the soul of millions at once. Oh, John, if you weren't so risky, we would have seen more of your work, but we shall be satisfied with what we have. By the way, old DeLorean DMC-12s are on sale now at the price from $10,000 up to $35,000 depending on the condition. A fully rebuilt car costs around $40,000. And if someone suddenly has so much money in the piggy bank, it is necessary to get a hold of the legendary car. And who knows, suddenly you'll get on a road with Doc, and together you'll conquer boundless open spaces of the future.